Okay, hello everyone. On behalf of the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, I'd like to welcome all of you to this special evidence dialogue webinar on women's economic empowerment. This is the second of our evidence dialogues. Uh, this is a monthly seminar which focuses on evidence and insights on the effectiveness of different approaches to international development. The series touches on different subjects each month and brings together some of the most experienced voices in the development community to discuss the role and importance of evidence in decision making. We hope our new series allows for deeper engagement within the development community and beyond. And we hope you will enjoy listening and invite you to participate in this discussion. My name is Sebastian Martinez. I'm the Director of Evaluation at 3IE. 3IE is a global leader in funding, producing, quality assuring, and synthesizing rigorous evidence. We support studies and review ed, uh, that examine what works, for whom, why, and at what cost in lower and middle income countries. We're also a global advocate for the generation and use of quality evidence and development decision making. So before we kick off, just a few housekeeping notes. When sending questions to the panel, please use the Q&A box for questions and not the chat function. So that's the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And when you, uh, send a, when you address a question, please mention the panelist that you would like the answer from. If for any event, this event is, um, is, is disrupted, uh, we were, we're going to shut it down and we'll be in touch with you by email. The event's also being live streamed on YouTube and shared on social media. So if you're joining the event via live stream, you can add your questions through the comment box. Also, we encourage you to tweet any questions or points of view on Twitter. Please use the tag at 3IE News while you tweet and hashtag Evidence Dialogues. Okay, so let's kick it off. And before I introduce our distinguished panelists, I just wanna say a few words about our, about our motivation for being here in the first place. So the issue of women's economic empowerment has been on the front and center of the minds of the development community for the past several years. We talk about achieving outcomes like increasing women's labor market participation, closing wage gaps, increasing women's control over their household finances, but progress in this direction has been slower than expected. A likely reason for this is that women's economic empowerment is only part of the issue. We're stuck looking at a single tree rather than considering the whole forest. In order to truly empower women, we need to consider their social and personal empowerment as well. Women must have the personal agency to engage in economic activities to fulfill the vision and the institutional structures, including those relationships and social norms, must allow women to follow through on this vision. Economic empowerment is not only an issue of having resources in the form of assets and human capital. It also means having the opportunity through these other mechanisms. To get this conversation started this morning, we're gonna be joined by Sushila Devi in a pre-recorded video message. Sushila is a member of a self-help group in India, and in this recording, she describes the impacts that this group has had on her economic empowerment, on her agency and social role. So let's get started by uh, rolling that. Hello, everyone. और खेती करने में बहुत आरामदायक है मतलब बहुत अच्छा होता है पानी भी कम लगता है और पैदावार ज्यादा होता है कम खर्चा में ज्यादा खेती होता है 
उसके अलावा बहुत सुधार हो गया है मेरे घर के लिए पहले तो मैं घर में ही रहती थी कहीं नहीं जाती थी ना खेत करती थी ना कुछ नहीं ना कहीं ब्लॉक लोग को आप पता था अभी तो ब्लॉक से समूह में जुड़ने के बाद तो सब चीज का सुविधा पता चलता है जैसे कि खेती बाड़ी करने का है पशुपालन करने का भी है बहुत साल साधन है कि जिसे योजना आता है वो पता चल जाता है और कभी कभी बाहर जाने के लिए हम लोग को भी मौका मिलता है पहले बात करने में थोड़ा सा अच्छी होता था अब मिलने से कुछ नहीं लगता है जिस सरकारी महिला मंडल में जुड़े हैं तो वहाँ से हम पैसा लोन में ले के ही खेती कर रही हूँ और बस फिर और पैसा उठाई हूँ तो मेरा तेल मिल है वहाँ भी लगाई हूँ और फिर मेरा बेटा सिलाई मशीन खोला है जल टी एस के माध्यम से सीखा है तो स्कूल ड्रेस हम लोग बनवा रहे हैं मेरा बेटा स्कूल ड्रेस बना रहा है महिला मंडल में जुड़ने से मेरा बहुत आर्थिक स्थिति सुधार हो गया है और पहले डर लगता था कहीं निकलने आने जाने में थोड़ा सा किसी चीज करने में अब तो ऐसा नहीं लगता है So as as Sushila has shared with us economic empowerment can facilitate these other forms of empowerment inducing a virtuous cycle but where and how do we start and how has this task changed in light of our new realities uh, realities with covid to discuss these issues we're joined by four highly knowledgeable panelists Catherine Hay is the deputy director for gender equality at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Foundation. Sarah Iqbal is a program officer in global development and population at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Badisha Barua is a senior valuation specialist right here at 3IE. And last but definitely not least, Anjani Kochar is a senior research fellow at 3IE and the director of the India program at the Stanford Center for International Development or SCID. The impressive bios of all of our speakers uh, are available on the 3IE Evidence Dialogues website. So I invite uh, you to go and take a look. And to our panelists, uh, welcome to all of you and thank you very much for being here. So Catherine, let's get, let's get rolling. Um, in light, uh, let, let's just dive right in uh, and ask, I'm gonna ask you to start off by telling us a little bit about how you've been thinking about girls and women's empowerment at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, good morning, good evening uh, in India to everyone. Um, I'm really excited about the panel today because we're taking a very complex issue and phenomena and trying to unpack it a little bit, empowerment, and really think about what does it mean and how does it show up in programs and how does it sort of intersect and influence uh, outcomes of programs as well as being an outcome itself. So I think this is um, going to be a really interesting discussion. Um, we have seen over time some progress in terms of improving gender equality uh, in the last few decades, but we still see huge barriers remaining and it's going to take us hundreds of years to close those gaps at the current uh, pace of change. And so it's really important for us to be trying to understand uh, how, what those barriers are and to try to really unpack these ingrained complex barriers where we see the products of those barriers and we see the artifacts and we see how it's manifested, but we don't understand as deeply as we need to um, how, how, it's, how they're perpetuated over time. And so, one of the newest strategies at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is actually our gender equality strategy. It's only a few years old. Um, and when we started building it out, we knew that we wanted empowerment of women and girls to really be at the heart of everything we were doing. We knew and we had evidence from different programs that uh, approaches that were, that took empowerment at the core, um, A, just 
we're, we're better at getting some of the other outcomes, health and other outcomes that we wanted to see. But also we knew that without those changes, we would not be able to close the gaps. But at the same time, we didn't have great um, and detailed evidence on the nature of, of empowerment and how it was related to those outcomes. Um, so we wanted to both put empowerment at the heart of what we do, but we also wanted to be clear about what that meant. And, and we wanted to be able to also assess and evaluate it. So I'm going to share um, the model that we developed when we wanted to get more clear ourselves. And we certainly didn't uh, reinvent the concept of empowerment. But what we wanted to do was really draw on uh, decades of thought and learning by academics, activists, implementers, women and girls in the countries that we uh, worked in. Uh, many of our partners had been applying these concepts to their work for a long time. And so we really wanted to look at what was there and understand it and distill it in a way that we could then apply it meaningfully and not simply say empowerment is at the heart of everything we do, but really know what that meant and to be able to also hold ourselves accountable to tracking that and assessing that and understanding that. Uh, and we worked with uh, one of our partners, the Royal Tropical Institute in the, in the Netherlands to pull that into a framing. And so um, if everybody will permit me, I'll just walk us through that framing. And this isn't going to be sort of a lecture conversation throughout, but just to kind of tee us up so that we are being specific when we're talking about empowerment and trying to have a bit of a common language um, as we talk about that for the rest of uh, the session. So I'm just going to share my screen. And I hope that you can um, see that. And so I'm going to assume you can, or somebody would alert me. Um, so I just want to start first with a, a definition. We define empowerment as the expansion of choice and strengthening of voice through the transformation of power relations so that women and girls have more control over their lives and future. Empowerment is a process of ongoing change, but it's also an outcome of women and girls having greater influence and control over their own lives and future. So I'm going to quickly go through the components. Agency is at the heart of our model, and agency refers to the capacity of women and girls to take action and pursue goals free from the threat of violence or retribution. So you can see if you are looking for agency, you're going to see different things. So some of the ways we might see agency expressed include decision making, leadership, and collective action. For example, women and girls express agency when they influence and make decisions and when they establish and act on their goals. Leadership can be a really powerful expression of agency. For example, when we see women and girls leading and inspiring social change. And uh, very pertinent to today's session, I think. Agency can also be expressed collectively. Women and girls engage in collective action when they stand together in solidarity to transform institutions and power relations. I wanna talk about the next piece of the model now, the institutional structures. So our model locates institutional structures in the spaces where women and girls live their lives, the family, community, the market, and the state. In each of these spaces, institutional arrangements are shaped by formal laws, but also by norms and relationships among groups and individuals. Now, building out the resources side of the model, we often think about resources as tangible assets, like we heard in uh, the SHG member at the very beginning of the presentation, we heard about finance, for example. Um, resources, though, can also be knowledge, they can be time, uh, for example, right now, very pertinent in the pandemic we're going through, on average, women and girls around the globe spend more than twice as much time on unpaid care and domestic work as men do. And those numbers are much higher in India, where I know we have a lot of uh, people joining us for this uh, webinar. Resources also include social capital, like relationships and social networks, which in turn can contribute to strengthening critical consciousness and shaping criti uh, collective action. And resources also include bodily integrity, which means a woman or girl having uh, control over her physical and mental well-being. I 
And I want to talk a little bit, finally, a bit more about that, that about critical consciousness, because in some ways, I think it's often one of the most ignored components, especially when we're looking at evaluations and models. Um, but I think it's one of the most key. And critical consciousness is when women and girls identify and question how inequalities and power operate in their lives and affirm their sense of self and their rights. And so we see as, a women, as women or girls gain critical consciousness, their aspirations, their sense of self-awareness, their confidence, their self-esteem and self-efficacy uh, can grow. And so if we look at all of these pieces together, um, you know, sort of, so what? How does empowerment occur, if one can uh, put it so bluntly? Um, so very simply, and it's not simple, of course, and it's very challenging to measure, but women and girls experience empowerment when their inner change connects with shifts in institutional structures and systems, and bringing about transformation of power relations at both the individual and the social levels. So basically, when we talk about in the development sector, when we throw around, you know, that this is empowering, empowering, or we have an empowerment approach, or working on women's economic empowerment, we need to ask ourselves, is this work transforming consciousness and structures in order to really be true to what that means? Looking across these different components or elements, they all inter interact, which again makes it very complex. This is not linear. Um, and so from an evaluation point of view, this is quite complex to unpack, especially empirically. But changes across all of these elements inter interact. So changes in agency, institutional structures, and resources can be mutually reinforcing. For example, women who participate in collective action and uh, successfully, for example, get access to a public works program. So a woman joins a group, they collectively uh, act together, they get access to a government program that may unlock access to productive resources, which may in turn give them more power and influence and decision making within their household. But conversely, constraints in one dimension or one set of elements can be a barrier. For example, efforts to increase women's decision-making power within her household may be unsuccessful if norms in the community perpetuate and continue uh, the expectation that women not say speak up in their own homes. So that's really what I wanted to introduce uh, just to give us some grounding when we talk about empowerment in terms of what are the components that we're trying to act on or change and what are we seeing change. The model really is just a tool. We can use it in a range of ways. We're using it in a range of ways at the foundation. We can use it to consider how policies and programs, including in the current COVID context, may be experienced by women and girls uh, differently and also by different women and girls. There's an intersectional element to this model. We, I won't go into that in detail uh, just for time constraints, but it is there. Um, we can use this to ensure that women and girls' voices are prioritized in shaping the programs and policies that affect their lives. We can use it to anticipate and monitor unintended consequences that may rise from, for example, challenging existing power structures. And we can use it, I think pertinent to today's conversation in particular, to measure progress in programs and try to capture and understand the dynamics of change across these different elements. So I really just wanted to introduce this to give us maybe hopefully a bit of a starting point as we start diving in to programs and to work that are meant to be empowering to really um, start with a bit of a framing on empowerment um, and ask ourselves, use that to sort of ask ourselves um, whether these programs that we're going to be talking about today or work um, include, you know, these elements are changing those elements, are they truly empowering, and, and also how, how do we uh, encourage and foster sort of those deeper change processes. So I'm going to stop there, Sebastian, and uh, hopefully that gives us a bit of a grounding to kick off the rest of the uh, session. Thank you. Well, wonderful, Catherine. Thank you so much for sharing the, the, this very, very useful conceptual framework. Uh, I think it's a perfect way to start off the discussion and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll actually have some time to unpack some of these element, elements 
over the course of the next uh, hour or so. So uh, thank you very much for, for kicking us off. Uh, we're going to now turn it over to, to Sarah. And um, Sarah, I wanted to ask if you could tell us um, a bit about some of the major challenges uh, that the Hewlett uh, Foundation is fo focusing on uh, and where you think uh, that uh, some progress is being made. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Uh, and thank you, Catherine, for providing the overview of the Gates Foundation model. I think that's a really good starting point uh, for this discussion. And I wanted to also thank the audience for being here with us. So uh, I'm gonna start uh, my remarks from the outset by saying I've been at the Hewlett Foundation for about six months working on women's economic empowerment. Uh, but prior to that, I was at the World Bank working on the same issue for about 12 years. So I can give a, a little bit of both perspectives uh, in what I'm going to say. And at Hewlett Foundation, this is, um, the women's economic empowerment strategy is also our newest strategy. It's only about five years old, but it builds on the work that uh, the Hewlett Foundation has been doing over 50 years on women's health and human rights. And the idea was really to focus on another element of empowerment, uh, specifically on economic outcomes. And as we'll see in this conversation here today, women live their lives holistically. It's not only about economic ends, but we need to think about all of um, the different elements of empowerment. That being said, women's economic empowerment is a, a fairly nascent field. I remember when we first, um, when I first started working at on this at the World Bank, this was not an issue area that got a lot of attention. The attention has really increased, I would say, over the last five, six years. Uh, and at Hewlett Foundation, our approach focuses on the building blocks of women's economic empowerment. We have a very sort of macro policy approach and the idea is you need to build the foundation for this work. And the, the way that we see the foundational aspects are on gender data, gender disaggregated data, uh, sort of research and advocacy specifically on these issues. And I'll, I'll go into each of them in a bit. The idea behind having better uh, gender disaggregated data is just so that women's working lives can be visible. Uh, and so we had the video from Sushila Devi in the, in the beginning of this presentation. And I think that's a perfect example. She works in the informal sector. She wouldn't be counted in uh, economic statistics like uh, labor force participation. But of course the work that she does is important. It's productive. She should be reflected in the statistics. So what we do is we really sort of work on methods to improve gender disaggregated data to make sure that women are not invisible. Uh, and they uh, sort of tend to be invisible in these statistics because they disproportionately work in the informal sector, because they spent a disproportionate amount of time on care activities, child care, elder care, work in the household. That is all activities um, that should be counted as productive activities, but just are invisible. And because they're invisible, uh, sort of policymakers really don't consider them when they make policy. And I just want to bring up a really interesting example, um, sort of that's not from the development space, but I think it makes a lot of sense. And that example is on uh, sort of crash test dummies. So I'm, I'm reading this great book, uh, Invisible Women by Caroline Perez, and I will sort of call it out because crash test dummies are based on the average weight and size of an American male. Uh, and, you know, I am not as tall, I don't weigh as much as an American male, but the seatbelt that design is designed for a man. And what that means is when I push the seat up in my car, when they're looking at airbags, that's not designed for my body type. And actually that leads to greater injury of women in car crashes and actually an increased uh, rate of death of 17% of women. Well, sort of women's body types are different than men's body types. It's just not reflected in the data uh, because women are considered to be smaller men. And I'm using this as a metaphor for the development space as well. Uh, women tend to have different lived realities than men. They tend to go in and out of the labor market. They work in the informal sector. They have different responsibilities and that really needs to be considered in policymaking. If we're not in the data, that's just a foundational building block that's not there. Uh, the second area that we really work on is research because again, research needs to reflect women's re lived realities. 
and ultimately economic models tend to ignore the gender drivers of employment, of entrepreneurship, uh, of financial inclusion, if we're not included in the models, the research really doesn't show how women contribute to the economy in productive and different ways. And we can't really value the work that women do. We can't make it visible for policymakers if research isn't specific to that. So we focus on improved research, especially on the unpaid uh, sort of care sector, on the care economy, because we think that's critical to women. And quite frankly, in this time of COVID, that's come up in stark relief. We're looking at a sort of a recession that's been called a C-session, uh, a term that I don't like, but quite frankly, you know, women work more in service sector jobs. They're dropping out of the workforce more uh, because of these COVID lockdowns, but also because they have additional care activities at home and they face the extra time poverty and burden of time poverty. And we want the research really to focus on uh, women's lived realities. And the third pillar that we focus on is advocacy. Uh, we want um, sort of advocates to use the data, to use the research to really target policymakers for activities that improve uh, women's economic empowerment outcomes, but also women's social outcomes. Uh, and here the challenge is a lot of um, advocates working in the space take a, a rights-based approach, which they should, but they should also marry it with an economic empowerment approach because we see this as two sides of the same coin. Uh, and so these are the three foundational pillars that we work on, the idea being to build up this base uh, so that we can sort of have this foundational work and help policymakers understand that gender neutral policies uh, sort of are gender blind. You really need to be intentional about it to make sure that women are reflected in whatever policy uh, arena that you're working on, whether it's uh, pensions, social protection, financial inclusion, women are different than men. Uh, and if that's not considered at the outset, uh, sort of women get left out. Um, and actually one of the things that we're doing now because we're sort of at the five-year mark of the strategy is really thinking now instead of being in the silo, how do we connect it back to other social outcomes uh, for women uh, sort of uh, looking at social empowerment, looking at community empowerment. And I just want to leave uh, you with the final thought that a lot of women's economic empowerment uh, is measured through social measures. Right, so there are very much linkages. Um, and the question for us at Hewlett and one of the challenges is really how do we come up with a more holistic framework um, instead of just narrowly focusing on things like labor force participation. So thank you, Sebastian. Thanks, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, so, I mean, first of all, we're, we're, we're really happy that um, foundations such as the Hewlett Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, have put this issue uh, front and center. That's 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 really good to hear, um, and thank you for for sharing uh, these you know these details about your very important work program uh, with us. And I actually did not know the story about the test dummies, uh, but that's a, that's a, that's a great fact, and I will definitely be sharing it with my with my wife uh, after after the seminar. So thanks for sharing that one. Um, so I'm going to now move on to our next two panelists. Um, uh, Badishi, Badisha and Anjini uh, have both been leading a really impressive program of impact evaluation uh, in India on the N National Rural Livelihoods Mission, or NRLM. So Badisha, I'm going to invite you in first uh, to tell us about how this program uh, it relates to these various aspects of, of women empowerment and, um, and and also just tell us a little bit more about the NRLM, which uh, our audience may not necessarily be be familiar with. So, Badisha, over to you. Thanks, Sebastian. And uh, thank you, Catherine and Sarah, for the great, uh, you know, theory-based approach. Really, I think it will make uh, my uh, task quite quite easy. Um, I want to, uh, today I want to spend some time talking about the National Rural Livelihoods Mission uh, Program. It is, uh, it is a flagship program uh, by the government of India. It's aimed specifically at rural women. Um, women's empowerment, economic, 
personal and social is integral to the NRLM program. And it tries to achieve this by establishing women's groups, um, federating these groups um, into, into larger organizations uh, called uh, village organizations and then another tier going up called the cluster level federations. They built, the program builds access of these groups at multiple layers uh, to financial, human, and social capital. Credit is an important part of the program, linking women to uh, financial, in, uh, financial capital uh, is, 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 is the first step that is actually taken uh, within the NRLM program. There are trainings for livelihood enhancement. There are various handholding support that is given to boost women's confidence and their uh, mobility and <clears throat> generally their, being, uh, their, their feeling of self-worth. The program also tries to connect these groups of women to government schemes, and, and a very important pillar, as Catherine has pointed out, uh, to public and private institutions, building of social uh, capital, bringing these women together in collectives are all, all part of the NRLM uh, uh, implementation agenda. <laughs> in, 3i along with with anjani leading the evaluation and our partners Britti, undertook um, evaluation of the nrlm program in 2019 this was uh, almost 8 years after the program has been in in um, ha has been has, has been in operation i want to spend some time talking about wh what we found in in the evaluation i think uh, sushila ji actually summarized our findings very well I, only, I will only add to it. Um, our evaluation included data from over uh, 1,500 SHG women across nine states of India. Um, we, so, uh, we interviewed households as well as one woman from the, uh, from the household on various economic and non-economic aspects of, um, of, of their lives. The, the overall results are very encouraging. We find that after two and a half years of the program, or rather two and a half additional years of the program, led to large increases in household income, almost by 19%. And this happened because the program was successful in providing the much needed credit to households, reducing their dependence on usurious loans. The program established linkages to government welfare programs, um, particularly those that were related to social protection schemes. For women, I, I mean, all of that was really at the household level. So what was happening for women? For women who were the main participants of the program, we see improvements in their personal savings and their uh, workforce particip uh, participation. Although most women are still involved in domestic work, unpaid domestic work, it's in the secondary uh, occupation where we see that a lot more women are getting involved in income generating activities. We see the most, I have already spoken about a bit about the structure of the NRLM, about how small uh, self-help groups of 10, 15 women are, are integrated into larger groups of uh, village level federations of around say 50 to 100 women. It is at this level where we see the biggest benefits of the program coming in. This is also in some form a validation of the unique uh, nature of the program, essentially the tiered system of this program. We see, that, uh, most ben uh, we see the most benefits to women through the process of federation and through the process of collectivization. Women who are linked to federations are able to access higher amount of loans from SAGs. They report better nutritional outcomes in terms of food diversity. What was striking to us was that women who, who were federated reported significantly higher scores in a confidence in the index that we developed. This confidence index was based on, um, on, on certain measures which indicated what, their, what is their confidence in dealing with their interactions outside their homes and with the community. Uh, so certainly, I, and I would like to refer to uh, Catherine's presentation here, 
when it came to providing resources such as financial assets, health and social capital, and boosting women's confidence, the program made a difference. But what was really surprising for us was that no matter which way we looked at it, we saw no impact on women's uh, decision making within the household. And this was very perplexing for us. Um, we, we have to examine further why we don't see this. And uh, this is really um, something that we are working on. Uh, we, there, and what, what could be the possible reason where we see women's personal savings improving, we see household, income, household economic outcomes improving, but we don't see women's, uh, women be, uh, having more agency within their households. Um, well, of course, you know, one shortcoming of our study is, uh, of the study as it is now, is that we could not adequately understand uh, the safety and security aspect that is critical for women. Um, intimate partner violence, general uh, threats of threat that women uh, receive uh, or perceive in their interactions was something that our um, study did not capture. We also, uh, while we interviewed women, we did not interview men. So we don't really know what is what are women's, uh, what are men's opinion of the program and what are their expectations? Are these aligned? Uh, these are really uh, interesting questions. Overall, I thought that this was a really, um, a, a very strong program, a very well thought out program. And we, a lot more needs, a uh, lot more research is needed in this front. I'll stop there, Sebastian. Thanks, uh, Badisha, uh, and thanks for sharing those fascinating uh, findings and obviously new lines of, of inquiry that are, that are opening up. Um, one of the things that I've been very excited to see about um, the NRLM study is it's working its way into high-level policy circles and, and discussions and decision-making in, um, in, in India. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is an evaluation that uh, that, that actually is, is, is you know, changing lives and influencing how, how policy is made. And that's always really exciting to see. Um, so uh, Anjani, I'm gonna now turn, turn, turn to you. And I've, uh, I've, I've heard really uh, exciting new, new work, new research uh, coming out uh, within the NRLM uh, research agenda, uh, focusing specifically on the question of women's uh, empowerment. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Thank you, Sebastian. And it's an honor to be on this panel along with everybody else. And thanks to all the participants for joining us for this webinar. Uh, Sebastian said, you know, we have this overall evaluation of NRLM, and then we are doing a number of specific papers and specific themes. And so I'm gonna be really specific in my comments compared to uh, the panelists who went before me and focus on a a paper that we've just finished. The paper is entitled, The Policies That Empower Women. And so the focus again within that is just specifically on policies and specifically on women's bargaining power, which is just uh, you know, one, um, one component of all that we're talking about. I'm gonna be even more specific for this talk and I'm, I'll frame my comments in the context of a marriage, uh, but things apply equally to the workplace and other institutions that women are involved in. So to start off, we can think of women entering a marriage with an initial amount of bargaining power, reflecting, as Catherine has noted, her initial resources, her education, but also existing policies, social norms, and laws. So the question we ask in this paper is, can we improve this initial level through policies and through new institutions? And the answer is, it depends on how those policies impact the dependence of wives and husbands on the marriage for their well-being. So this is a specific definition of dependency that I'm using. It's the difference between each person's welfare within the marriage and their welfare levels if they were not married to each other. That is their standalone or autarkic levels of welfare. It's worth emphasizing that the standalone level is very well understood, uh, even if divorce is never a possibility. All of us who are married uh, and our spouses generally have a very clear idea how dependent we are on each other for our well-being. Uh, and that is really the concept that we're using over here. In using that framework, it suggests the importance of a specific threshold. For any given policy, that threshold is a level of benefits that will make men and women equally dependent on each other. 
women's initial bargaining power will then only improve with policies that provide resources sufficient to meet or cross this threshold. So this is actually a, a significant point. It says that small changes that still leave women more dependent on the marriage than a man will not change her bargaining power. But this is the main point I want to convey. Small incremental changes will have no impact unless they accumulate over long periods of time. Big changes are required, particularly if women are significantly disadvantaged. This means large improvements in her resources, changes in laws that really move the needle, large social movements like the Me Too movement. I want to make two additional points. The first is the difference uh, that I'm emphasizing in this uh, talk, the difference between women's welfare and her bargaining power or agency. We all know and we've seen the tremendous improvement that women have made it's reflected in their levels of education. They are healthier, they live longer, maternal mortality has dropped significantly, but women still lack agency within the household and their workplaces. And that's the difference between women's welfare and her bargaining power. Once we accept that there's a corollary, policies that improve women's welfare without reducing her dependence on her husband may have little impact on her bargaining power. So if you take SAGs and a loan from an SAG, for example, the woman gets the loan, but if she is only able to repay it with income that her husband earns, it may do nothing for her bargaining power. Our research on women's empowerment in this paper um, supports this framework. We find an insignificant improvement in an index of women's decision-making ability in SAGs, in which loans are given only out of the internal savings of SAG members. These are small loans, and this is the finding that Badisha referred to earlier. But NRLM also provides a large cash infusion to SAGs in the form of a community investment fund. And states were free to decide how much to extend to each SAG. Some states provided a very large amount, uh, one lakh rupees or one million rupees, while others provided just 30,000 rupees. That means some SAGs were able to double the size of the loans, but in other SAGs, the loan increased eightfold. In those states in which it increased the most, in these high CIF states, we find large improvements in women's decision-making power, but not in others. Uh, that is just reinforcing the conclusion of uh, these, my comments. It's not just the policy that matters. It's the magnitude of the benefits that the policy confers. Thanks, Ash. Great, thanks, thanks, Anjani, and thanks for for, for sharing uh, these these results uh, from from this exciting uh, new new research. Um, you, you heard it first on uh, evidence dialogues, folks. So uh, watch out, watch out for the paper. Um, thanks, Anjani, and, and, and thanks to, to all the panelists uh, for really getting us off some, with some very thought-provoking um, insights. So we're gonna now move on to the Q&A uh, session, and I'm gonna invite uh, everyone who's, who's connected uh, around the globe to start uh, sending the panel your questions uh, through the, through the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your, um, of your screen. Um, but I'm gonna uh, take niche uh, of my position as chair and kick us off with a couple of, uh, of initial questions. And I'd like to come back first uh, to Anjani uh, and, 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 and Badisha back to NRLM um, and, and, and you know, press you a little bit on, uh, on policy recommendations. Um, so, you know, what, what would be some of the recommendations that are coming out of this line of research um, on NRLM? And, uh, you know, do, do these recommendations, you know, how do they change? This research has been now ongoing for, you know, a couple, a couple years. Um, there is obviously the new context of, of uh, the global um, COVID pandemic. And so, you know, do, do you think about these policy recommendations differently? In the present context, um, so maybe maybe Badisha, I can I can hand it back to you, and then we'll go to Anjani. Um, and I'd ask you to keep your answers to maybe three or four minutes, please. Thanks, Sebastian. I uh, um, I mean, we, one could think of uh, of several recommendations um, uh, within the program within the NRLM or NRLM type programs. 
But what I wanted to focus on rather is uh, on the structure, on the implementation structure of the NRLM program itself. And I'll just take one minute to explain how this program is being rolled out um, and why I see potential in this. Uh, this the, the NRLM program has a very unique way of scaling up because I think it recognizes that it's only through scale that you can really make an impact. The scale-up plan of, um, of, of NRLM is that it, ha it establishes a system whereby an experienced uh, community development person, they are also called mobilizers or uh, community resource persons, go into a village, they identify a set of local women who are then trained uh, to, to mobilize further women. So it's, it's a very women-to-women -women kind of a um, scale up model that's there and these women who are initially identified who then go and go who, who are first identified and trained and then go out to re reach out to other women are called uh, internal some of the sometimes they're called internal crps uh, community resource resource persons and at other times they're called uh, sometimes they're also called active women just active women who are uh, responsible for this out out outreach and this provides a very nice, a great op opportunity to build women's social capital and their confidence. So you have taken a, a set of women within a local context, you have trained and you have um, empowered them to further reach out to other women. I see a lot of potential in them, in that. Secondly, uh, I also want to emphasize the role of how within this set of, uh, you know, women, uh, some Again, there is this level of selection where, uh, you know, some women are selected for livelihood to provide livelihoods, training, services, and uh, other kind of support to the, to the community. And these are called community cadres. So here, this community cadre provides a great opportunity for women to earn income. Essentially, in this entire uh, system of scale up, empowerment is to a large extent inbuilt and one really needs to uh, you know, use it to its full potential. My recommendation therefore would be to strengthen this method of, of scaling um, through sustained mentor mentorship of um, the community cadre and the active women um, or, or the initial group of women who, who. What we find is, how, how, however, what we find is that you know, the structure of self-help groups do change. You know, women leave, new women come in. Often these women, these new entrants, do not receive the kind of support that uh, perhaps the initial set of women who were mobilized received. So if, if sustained handholding and sustained mentor mentorship is being provided to local women, I see a lot of potential for, um, for really making a change in, um, in, 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 in women's economic and their personal empowerment. I would also recommend that uh, household men be included in some manner in this effort. Uh, they need to be sensitized to what the program tries to achieve and sensitized to the whole idea of what is the concept of, an, of, of, of a woman's agency and why it is important. So perhaps, you know, uh, you know bringing in men would be also a, a good idea to, to, um, to consider. Um, my, my, these two recommendations, I don't, I don't think they would any change, you know, in the light of COVID. In fact, uh, perhaps I'm being an optimist here, but I see uh, COVID as a great opportunity for women to learn new skills um, and to be introduced to new technologies of remote work and their digital literacy. So nothing that I would like to change about the other, uh, about the two recommendations that I had mentioned. Great, thanks. Thanks, Padisha. Um, and, and, and Anjani, I'd invite you to add on uh, or compliment or, or, uh, you know, or even disagree with, with, with Padisha in terms of, um, you know, what some of the key recommendations might be coming out of the NRLM um, uh, work uh, and, and or implications uh, in the time of COVID. I'm going to start by just discussing uh, some recommendations for NRLM, and I think the basic recommendation is standard to all programs and all policies. NRLM should know and build on the features of NRLM that are the most successful. 
So what are those? Uh, I previously mentioned that the magnitude of benefits would have to be large, and this goes back to the Community Investment Fund. I think uh, that variation in CIF across states is huge, and that's certainly something that should be emphasized. And I understand that in a recent set of policy decisions, uh, NRLM has made a decision to at least try to encourage states to increase the amount of CIF. These are the lower CIF states. Um, a second way of achieving a large magnitude of, um, uh, of benefits is to bundle different interventions so they add up to a large change. And NRLM has also started doing this. So they'll combine financial resources, uh, the financial inclusion that is a normal business of SHGs, with improved access to government safety nets, or they'll combine financial resources with improvements in nutrition. And this package, this bundling together, I think has a potential to have a far larger impact than just any single intervention. The third way to increase the magnitude of benefits is something that Badisha has, uh, has mentioned, it's scale. Improving the knowledge of rights and entitlements for members of one SAG will not make a change. But if all women in a village know about this, and if all men know that women know, this is going to have an impact. The huge feature of NRLM is it's a program that right from the start was planned to uh, be implemented on scale. And by scale, I mean not just geographical scale, but universal coverage within a village. And that really develops capacity within a village. This also raises a challenge that I think it's important to mention. An increase in scale normally comes with declining quality. So this is something uh, NRLM would have to pay very close attention to and monitor, otherwise all the benefits that we see will be eroded. I want to turn to your second question, uh, Sebastian, on COVID and SEGs. So in this, um, since, uh, since COVID, we've all witnessed a growing role for SEGs as partners with the government enabling the dissemination of information on safe health practices, delivery of welfare benefits, and the production of masks. I think this is clear evidence of an additional contribution of SAGs over and above any impact through improving women's lives through financial resources. And that is the development of social networks that connect women. In NRLM, because of scale, these networks exist at the level of hamlets, at the level of village governments or gram panchayats as they're called in India, and our blocks, and they're promoting the development of a more collectivist society. If you look at the worldwide response to COVID, there's a clear difference between the responses that are possible in collectivist versus individualistic societies. And I think we should rightly applaud the role of SAGs and recognize that they may be one contributing force to shaping a more collectivist society. But we also need to address the impact of COVID on women's agency within marriage. There's a general belief, and this is being echoed um, more so now, that when incomes collapse, women's status deteriorates. And the framework I discussed earlier helps to understand this. With the decline in male wages, men are worse off, but they are worse off both within the marriage and outside the marriage. And so their dependence on the marriage does not change. For women, market wage may have fallen, but her value in home production, that is the value within the marriage, may have even increased. She's working harder than, than she ever used to, uh, basically to try and keep the household together. So this is a paradoxical result. A woman's value within the marriage has increased, but her status has been reduced, and she has even less say. She's much more subject to violence. How could this happen? It's because her husband recognizes that she is now even more dependent on the marriage and he can take advantage of this. The general conclusion, and again, this comes back to policy recommendations. The policy focus has to be on providing women the means and ability to be autonomous or to live an autonomous life, whether they choose to or not. For SAGs, the benefits of improved access to credit will translate into an improvement in women's status only if the loans are used to invest in women. I'll stop there for now. Great, thanks, thanks, uh, Anjani. And before uh, turning to Sarah and Catherine, um, I've been uh, sort of browsing through some of the comments that are coming through. Really, really great questions, and it's great to see um, you know all of our participants connecting from different parts of the world. So um, I see participants from Sri Lanka, from Niger, from India. 
uh, and, and, and many other countries. So thanks for, thanks for sending in uh, those comments. And we've got, I think, a couple of good, uh, good questions uh, for Anjani and, and Badisha, which I think it might make sense to just go ahead and, and tackle now. So um, there's two, two questions, actually, Badisha, on a question that you already raised, which is about involving, um, involving men. Uh, so, you know, how, how, how would you think about this? I mean, what might be some way uh, to, to, to productively engage uh, with men so they become uh, agents of change and become part of this process in, in, in women's economic empowerment or empowerment more generally? That's a very relevant question, Sebastian. Um, you know, there is, while I strongly recommend that uh, men be included, in, in, in some way into the program, there, one must also be aware of the fact that men may actually come and uh, you know, usurp the benefits of the program or rather hijack the program for their own benefits. That's absolutely possible in an unequal power dynamics. I think where, women, where men can be actually brought in uh, is uh, to really at the, at the mobilization and the training phase. And um, so that they can understand uh, what is in it for them and also what is why women's empowerment in itself is good for their families and their societies. Um, when I say men, I don't mean only husbands or the household men. Rather, the community needs to be sensitized because it is really the gender norms that restrict or uh, you know, govern to a large extent, women's role. So, uh, I, I, and I think that there has been some uh, experiments uh, around this. I'm not sure how successful they have been, but to use the community, to bring the community, to involve other uh, community-based in institutions and the local government. The, 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 um, the government currently under NRLM is very actively pushing this agenda, and I think it is in the right direction to include other institutions, local institutions, which may have more representation of men, um, would, is, 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 is a great path to go, go down. Great, thanks. Thanks, Vadisha, and thanks uh, to Bernadette and to uh, Luisa uh, for sending in those, those questions. Um, and, and Anjani, I'm going to uh, address one of the uh, questions coming in to you, and I don't want to go too deep into the weeds on methods and identification, but we've got a, a, a question from Stacy uh, Prieto, who asks um, if the uh, size of the loans uh, to the SHGs wasn't random, um, how, how are you able to tease out uh, some sort of causal relationship in terms of the size of the loan uh, and these effects you've been talking about? Uh, yeah, the uh, econometric framework is broadly a difference in different strategy. And so we're exploiting variation in the phasing of CIFs across, um, actually at a very low level across blocks, but within across villages within the blocks. Uh, and that phasing was a phase phasing. So that's the first level of the difference. And the second is the difference in the policy stipulated amount of the state, so not the actual amount that was given as a loan, but the state made announcements prior to, um, prior to the release of CIF on every year, and this is the amount that the state decides this policy. So it's a combination of this cross-sectional variation in the amount of the loan and the phasing of the loan across housing. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Anjini, for, for, for just clarifying that for, for all of our listeners. Okay, so I'm going to now turn um, back to Sarah and, and, and Catherine, and I'd like, to, I'd like to step back to some of the original um, you know, fr framework questions um, and, and ask, ask you, how do you see uh, these, these you know, differential elements of empowerment around agency, institutions, resources, et cetera, um, shaping the differential experiences uh, and, and impacts for women? Um, and, and, and especially again, you know, coming back to the present day conditions uh, under, under COVID. Um, so, so Catherine, um, if you wouldn't mind uh, perhaps uh, sharing your thoughts um, and you know, I'll ask you to keep them to three to four minutes. Uh, thanks, Sebastian. And there's some great questions in the chat as well. So I will keep this short so that we can definitely try to get to the, some of those. Um, I think we're seeing that with COVID-19, we're seeing really a kind of widening 
uh, of, of gaps based on a lot of the elements uh, in the model that I happen to start with. And so what we're seeing is the risk of actually losing track, losing progress with sort of widening and growing gaps across a range of fronts that are amplified and exacerbated by the kinds of inequities, the base inequities that we've started from. And we're seeing this across a range of areas globally. So one that I think is probably feels very real to probably you know, almost everybody on this call is just the growing increase in unpaid work, um, whether that's child care or elder care or other forms of, of household work. Um, globally, we're seeing sort of increases um, around the world, and we are seeing men taking on more child care and unpaid care work. So there is, you know, everyone is doing more, but we're seeing that women are taking on much more. Um, and we're seeing that in uh, we're seeing that manifest in different ways. Women more likely to leave the workforce, for example, in some contexts, potentially leading to kind of widening uh, uh, widening income and employment gaps. They're going to have an impact for generations. Um, so we're seeing these things uh, play out again across any element. If you look at sort of aspects of the model and how we see, for example, traditional norms, gender norms, uh, when you have, say, a heterosexual married couple uh, and someone has to drop out of the workforce, uh, assuming that they're wealthy enough for someone to do so, how it's much more likely, say, in the United States, that that would be the woman. So we're seeing sort of how these aspects of empowerment, how they become can become reinforced in times of crises in negative ways, which doesn't mean that there's not an opportunity. So this is sort of what we're experiencing right now is um, so uh, huge. Uh, there are also opportunities here to potentially kind of transform um, um, things like childcare and who does what. And so with men, for example, doing a lot more and be being forced, frankly, to be more engaged in childcare. There's also an opportunity there. Maybe in some countries we will see a real disruption that could also be positive. Um, connecting to NRLM, since we've been digging into that, um, I think one of the things we're seeing, for example, in looking in, I saw we had some folks joining us from Nigeria, so welcome. Um, so one of the things that we've seen, for example, to, to look at India and Nigeria, um, in both cases, you know, we've seen evidence uh, looking at how being part of a group can provide some sort of resilience in times of crisis where the network, the access to savings can kind of lead to some initial consumption smoothing. And we've seen in both contexts um, things like uh, initial economic opportunities, um, uh, communications messaging kind of being taken on by groups. Um, and, and that can seem very positive, right? So we can feel very pleased that um, women in groups are communicating uh, social distancing measures. They're becoming engaged in, um, in, in sort of um, enterprises and uh, creating sort of PP, uh, protective uh, equipment and tools. And we can sort of feel very positive about this. But I think what we need to really be paying attention to is the bigger picture that women's micro enterprises, emerging data is showing that they're going to be the most severely impacted globally. They're the most likely to close. Their incomes are decreasing the most. They're unlikely to have access to a lot of the financial stimulus packages because they don't have enough employees. Um, and we see, for example, in India, um, you know, the emergence of a multi, multi crore PPE industry. And so we can be celebrating that, look, there's, you know, 7,000 women that have been part of it making sort of uh, X or Y, um, but not necessarily paying attention to the much larger picture, which is one of um, women's enterprises being actually the most likely to, especially micro enterprises, the most likely to fail, to be left behind, to not be served. And so I think we need, and that that's for reasons of, you know, the, the, the networks needed to access finances. So going back to the model, um, so that the, the increased child care burden. So we saw in a recent sort of Facebook enterprise survey that the number one thing that women enterprise owners with children under the age of five required and were demanding was child care. And so their businesses being forced to shut in part because of the amount of time that they had to spend 
on, on child care. So some of these underlying elements that sort of hamper or limit or impede, you know, women's enterprises. And so I think also p looking at that big picture to make sure that we're, you know, really uh, operating at, and supporting women at the kind of scale we need, uh, to Anthony's point, and the levels we need to really avoid a sort of deepening and widening of uh, the economic impacts by gender. Thanks, th thanks, Catherine, and thanks for you know for highlighting this issue of of of, of differential uh, impacts. Uh, you know, obviously, men and women are being uh, impacted by the by the present crisis, um, but but women, um, you know, disproportionately so. And I think that's that's really important to keep uh, on the minds of you know the research community, the the the, the policy community, um, as they think about uh, you know where 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 to focus their. Uh, their, their questions um, and their efforts uh, in terms of, of, of designing uh, policy. So, so a very important point. Um, Sarah, um, I'll, I'll ask you to, to jump in and share, share, share your, your views on this same question uh, around, um, uh, you know, differential elements of, of empowerment and how, um, you know, those are, those are, those are shaping up uh, in terms of experiences and impacts uh, for women under COVID. Certainly, thank you, Sebastian. And just building on what Catherine said, really what we're seeing is gains that have been made in the last 10 years, the last 15 years, just being wiped out uh, across the board when you look at it. So Catherine talked about women's micro enterprises, but you can talk about health and education outcomes, right? Like we're seeing closing of schools for health reasons, but when schools reopen, you know, who's, who will parents send back? You know, girls are more likely to stay out of uh, education once they've kind of um, stayed home for a while. And so what are policies that we can do to encourage parents to send their girls back to school? On health outcomes also, we see sort of lack of access to family planning and care. You know, how can we design policies to make sure that these um, sort of, uh, there's not regression in these areas? And in particular on economic aspects, you know, women are dropping out of the labor market because of time poverty, because uh, they have more of a care burden. Even when men are um, picking up some of it, it's disproportionately falling on, on women, especially working mothers. Uh, in addition to that, I, I was really struck by Anjani's um, comments about intra-household bargaining power and how the social sphere really affects the economic sphere for women. And we see this, there's a lot of um, stress in the social sphere now, you know, through the lockdowns, uh, through the increased care work, and that really sort of, there's, Catherine, when she was talking about the model, talked about how the elements can reinforce each other or they can reinforce in a negative trend. And unfortunately, what we're seeing through COVID is a lot of the, the negative implications of how uh, sort of things are moving backward. And sort of what, what I'm really concerned about is how do we, how do we stop that? Uh, and at least, you know, stop the regression and then start moving towards a, a progression. And, and sort of one of the ways to do that is uh, sort of improved social protection responses, really making sure that uh, these responses take into account the gender differential impacts, right? So this to me really fundamentally goes back to the data. How are women differently affected by some of these things that are happening? And, and there's a lot of really stark um, instances of this, like domestic violence is, is uh, one classic or rather a very clear example. When you're spending most of your time uh, in the home, you're seeing increased um, incidences of domestic violence, you're seeing, you know, uh, sort of increased incidences of child marriage, all of these things. How can we be sure that they're at top of mind of policymakers as they design policy responses uh, to to COVID, um, and I guess the the one positive that I see is people are talking about these issues more. I don't think I've ever heard uh, sort of discussions of care go um, on more in the policy space, whether it's child care, whether it's elder care. It's a problem that women face in their personal lives that really affects. Um, sort of their economic lives, but now you're seeing sort of policymakers in countries, you're seeing leaders of IFIs, you're seeing discussions in the media about care. 
But that to me is, is, is a really important step in designing policy responses that can sort of try and reduce um, sort of the differential impact on women. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sarah. I mean, and, and as you're speaking, I'm sort of reflecting at how, you know, the, the intersection between uh, research and policy, you know, come to the forefront and the sense of, you know, having data, having evidence that can be brought uh, into these into these discussions uh, and, and, and in a very timely manner, um, you know, uh, as we all know, policymakers have to make quick Quick decisions, and so you know some some of the burden I think on the on the on the research and evidence uh, communities is how how can we you know help translate and and generate uh, those uh, those resources so that um, policymakers can make informed decisions. Um, so I'm going to stick uh, with with Sarah and, and and Catherine for a minute because we're getting a lot of uh, really good questions coming in uh, from from our audience. Um, and so I'll just throw these out there and I'll let you both uh, react to them. Uh, you can take either of them or, or focus on, on one more than the other. So the first question comes from uh, Ayushi um, Chaturvedi um, and she's asking, what, what do you think is the role of digital inclusion in women's economic empowerment? Um, and I'm guessing that there are probably efforts in both of your foundations around, uh, around digital inclusion um, given the nature of both of your foundations, especially. Uh, so, you know, how, how do you think about that and what my role for, for, for digital in inclusion? And then there's a second, a second question um, on uh, how uh, do, do other sources of social marginalization, uh, for example, race in some contexts, perhaps caste uh, in contexts uh, such as India, um, interact with women's uh, economic empowerment. Um, and maybe this directed specifically to you, Catherine, uh, in terms of how do those other elements um, uh, fit within the conceptual model uh, that, you, that, that you manage. So um, let, let me, let me uh, pass, pass the mic back uh, to you. Maybe we'll start, Catherine, with your reflections first on either or, or one or either or both of those questions, and then, and then I'll turn it over to, to Sarah. Thanks. Uh, I'm glad that that question of intersectionality has come up. Uh, I think it's critical to be looking at it uh, in the time of COVID as always, and I'm glad people have asked questions about it uh, with, re with reference to the model. Um, I have shared the link to the model and there's a uh, in the white paper informing the model, there's like a large section as well on intersectionality. Um, so I'm sorry we didn't have a lot of time to go into that uh, as I tried to give an overview of the model. But I think as anyone would see looking at those components of the model, um, one, you know, women and girls are not sort of an undifferentiated lot. And uh, certainly their experience of COVID is also not undifferentiated. Um, and so all of the elements in the model need to be understood with an intersectional lens. And so if we're looking at um, agency, if we're looking at access to resources, um, if we're looking at bodily integrity, um, we need to look at how those elements uh, are different and differently manifest for um, women across different social categories. And so absolutely by caste, by race, by class, um, there is not sort of one uh, uh, one experience of, of of COVID, and certainly there's not one experience, or the, there's not one sort of uh, undifferentiated uh, experience of women and girls. And we are seeing how, uh, I mean, everywhere around the world, we're seeing how that not only is there a widening of and deepening of gender gaps, but there's also a widening and deepening of other sites of difference and other cleavages. And so if we're looking at who are more likely, for example, to be um, essential workers um, forced to work in uh, unsafe conditions, for example, there's a gender dimension to that, but in some countries in India, there's a caste dimension to that, who needs to be out and working um, and at risk. In the United States, where I am based right now, there's a racial dimension to that. Um, and one of the things I want to flag is that we need, you know, we need to have better data. And so coming back to something Sarah said at the very, in her opening comments, um, even just looking at the, um, just looking at the differences, the biological 
uh, sex and biological differences of COVID as it began to roll out. It was months before we were actually looking at data that was looking at the impact, for example, um, by 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 race in the United States and looking at those really those high risk and vulnerabilities created by sort of decades of inequities along racial lines and how that was manifesting in differential um, burden and risk to um, people of color in the United States. And so I think without that data, without having that data that allows us to actually look at vulnerability and risk, we're really, we really have one arm sort of tied behind our back because we're not actually able to see where there's growing and deepening vulnerability. Um, you know, in looking at trying to model out, for example, what the potential impacts would be in terms of, say, women's labor force participation, it, it's amazing. Like we, you know, some of the work that, for example, McKinsey did early on, uh, really use data, Ashwini Deshpande's data from India uh, to try and model out what could be, in, and a few other sort of large studies to try and model out what could be the economic uh, differences globally, right? So you're having, we're having to like find like three studies or three sets of data to try to come up with what could happen in say low and middle income countries. So we're really data blind in a lot of ways um, on basics, like just even the tracking the pandemic by sex like which feels like how is it possible that there's countries that don't yet have data just in terms of say mortality figures by sex but there are um, so we're really blind on even just kind of basic data but then as we look at sort of the kinds of things we've been talking about today gbv unpaid care i mean we're even more blind when it comes to some of those dimensions or phenomena which we just don't track well generally so we definitely need to get um, better data to be able to look at both gender differentials but other differentials as well so i'm glad I, i'm glad that that's been raised i'll maybe hand over to sarah uh, if she wants to take uh, ayushi's question sure i can uh take ayushi's question i just also first wanted to second what you were saying about intersectionality i think it's vitally important um, and of course, you know, sort of women are not one coherent group. They break down in a multiplicity of ways. And we really need to look at the different factors to understand, especially in the time of COVID, who is being affected, how, and sort of, uh, sort of disproportionately how. And I agree that race and caste very much feed into that, uh, as do income group. And uh, sort of depending on the country, there's different breakdowns. But I, it's super important. I'm so glad the question was asked. In terms of digital inclusion on women's economic empowerment, I, I think it's key. Um, I think sort of uh, Catherine's colleagues at the Gates Foundation have done a lot of really, really interesting work on digital financial inclusion, um, sort of, and on the the uptake uh, of financial inclusion for women, especially through digital means in the time of COVID. I, I think there's two things that are really coming out. Uh, one is um, sort of digital access uh, and use for education, uh, especially sort of um, as children are not being able to go to school, who has access uh, and who is able to utilize and uptake that access for educational opportunities, uh, as well as, uh, for example, I've seen some um, sort of in, in various countries, women's groups, self-help groups not being able to meet, especially during the shutdowns. And then there was questions of how they could have access digitally and different models uh, were being used uh, sort of as workarounds. I, I think this is um, sort of something that's really amplified the need for better digital inclusion and also uh, digital inclusion um, sort of for some of the social protection responses, who is being reached, how are they being reached, uh, and really sort of who's invisible in these spaces. And often it's the most marginalized that are in invisible. And I, I wonder actually sort of uh, if Badisha has any uh, comments or reflections on that uh, digital access, um, especially in the shutdowns for self-help groups. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sarah and and and, and Catherine. Um, and you know, we've got lots and lo lots of really, really great questions uh, rolling in, and I wish we had uh, more time uh, to, to to tackle them. Um, but unfortunately, we're down to the last ten minutes or so. Um, uh, Gloria uh, Nadine from Rwanda was asking for resources around SHGs. I saw that uh, Badisha had already sent some some links. If there's any other links that the panelists um, 
want to uh, share through the chat, that would be uh, fantastic around the different questions. Again, really great questions. Um, but unfortunately, we're going to have to start wrapping this up. And so um, what I'd like to do now is give uh, each of the speakers just a minute or two, really, uh, to share um, any final thoughts that you have. I mean, we've talked a lot about this, um, you know, but but around incorporating uh, the, the gender lens into uh, the social protection response, you know, again, sort of in the in the current uh, crisis mode that many uh, in many countries and institutions are in under uh, under COVID. So, um, you know, if, if any any final uh, thoughts in terms of, um, of, of of opportunities or or, or, or challenges, um, and uh, we'll and then we'll and then we'll wrap it up. So um, maybe I'll come uh, first to to, to Catherine uh, for any final closing thoughts. Gosh, it's. I mean, I think we covered such a vast terrain and I, you know, have been trying to catch different questions um, as they come up and I think great questions. Um, I think let me come back to one final thought and it's, I mean, there was a range of questions when I was presenting, I think, on how do you measure these things and what as evaluators, I'm imagining many of our audience today are evaluators, researchers, kind of asking around sort of what are the elements of the model and how do we how do we measure some of these things in programs and what do we look at? Um, and there was some questions also on um, looking at differences between men and women and sort of some of the limitations of cross-sectional analysis, et cetera. So, I mean, on that, I would say one of the things that I found and I've worked with a range of, um, you know, great researchers, um, Yamini Amavilas and I, for example, uh, and the POP Council tried to look at in, in um, Uttar Pradesh, looking at the RGMVP program, like trying to empirically connect um, some of these different dimensions of uh, empowerment to outcomes through the um, through another large self-help group program, the RGMVP program. One of the challenges, I think, is some of the limitations of methods. And so this is to me, and somebody also asked a question around critical consciousness and how do you measure it. So I'll share in the chat after some resources and references from Emerge on different measures and how you can measure some of these things. But I think what becomes key is really, um, and I'm, again, I'm probably going to say state the obvious, is really trying to bring together deeper qualitative ethnographic uh, analysis with kind of more quantitative analysis. Because I think we have seen how when we have a multitude of phenomena that are interacting, um, and we're also looking at sort of a range of outcomes, it can become quite elusive to try to find sort of the one element that can show sort of the way that kind of empowerment processes sort of lead to these outcomes and to empirically kind of, uh, you know, isolate those um, dimensions in ways that sort of A, are meaningful, but also kind of useful to policymakers. And so, happy to kind of talk offline about any of that to anyone who's interested. Um, but I think really key is the key takeaways are a, you know, are we really paying attention to what we mean when we talk about things as empowering one um, are we B, are we holding ourselves ac accountable to really unpacking that, including with uh, women in the communities that we work to understand how they understand and see empowerment. Um, and, and see, are we really committed to actually uh, assessing that and evaluating that? And so we heard today about sort of the attempt to look at a program that I think many of us really see as very powerful, impactful, empowering in many ways and have seen evidence of that, but where we're hearing that we're not seeing the changes that we would have thought we might have been seeing on things like, say, decision making. Um, and, you know, it's so for me, key is that we are looking at these things because if we're not measuring them, we're not going to know if if things are really operating in the way that we hope they are or think they are. And we're not going to have that opportunity for change. So I think for me, the takeaways are um, really trying to unpack and not fall victim to sort of using some of these, throwing around some of these terms without really uh, really analyzing them and understanding them and without really trying to hold ourselves accountable for applying them and testing them um, and showing where we're seeing change and where we're not. So I guess that would be um, my, my main takeaway and that requires a mix of methods uh, and it requires investment. 
Thank, thanks, Catherine, for these these really really important um, thoughts and, and, and insights. Um, Sarah, over to you for, uh, for 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 closing thoughts. And Sarah, you're you're muted. So sorry. <laughs> I should uh, learn to unmute myself by now. It's been so many months. But thank you, Sebastian, uh, and thank you for all of uh, to all of you for listening to this webinar. For me, I think uh, one sort of really important closing thought that's been heightened through the comments of the other speakers and the questions is really the connections between the personal. Uh, the personal space, the space within the home, the intra-household discussions uh, and, and bargaining, and also the economic space, uh, and really how we need to think of the two together, because often interventions like what Badisha mentioned in NRLM, you're seeing a lot of uh, sort of impact on the economic side, but not really on agency, and agency is critical and key, but unless you can sort of shift um, the sort of the institutions are thinking of the language of the model, uh, whether it's the laws or the markets or the normative space around it, you might not get the magnitude of, of the change that you need to move past that threshold that Anjani was talking about. So it's really sort of the interconnections between all of these spaces and how do we then think of a policy response uh, that doesn't ignore one side of it. And that really takes us to the framing of this webinar, which is, you know, the connections between economic empowerment, but also personal empowerment and social empowerment. And as Catherine was saying, you know, uh, this is really something that's quite complicated and complex to unpack, but it's what we need to do if we want to get the impact that we want. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and now over uh, first to Badisha and then to, to Anjani to close this off just, uh, uh, just a minute or two uh, each with your final, final thoughts. I uh, just wanted to leave with, the, with just one statement that, um, you know, we really have to think if uh, programs that are meant for, that, are, that have women as their main uh, participants, are these even gender responsive or gender uh, inclusive? It's very, in, even in the design of the programs, one needs to take, uh, you know, take that the gender lens. Uh, otherwise, you know, as we have found and we have some uh, work around that, that there are a number of programs which are where the main, uh, you know, participant is a woman, the beneficiary is the woman, yet there is, it's completely gender blind all outcomes are measured at the household level. You know, we don't know if the, if the program even reached the women or not. These are important aspects and uh, certainly, you know, need more, more examination and more thought. Thanks, Patricia. Anjani. Uh, so in, in summing up, I, I think uh, one um, takeaway is that, as a point I made earlier, that SAGs are definitely enhancing a collectivist identity. I think that's invaluable. But I also want to recognize the vulnerability of local institutions to large aggregate economic shocks like COVID. Uh, SAGs can't provide loans to members when their savings have collapsed. And there's evidence, at least from NRLM, that that has happened. And the operations of SAGs themselves are severely constrained by the mobility restrictions of COVID. So SAGs, as we knew them, actually don't even exist right now. And a big open question is, can we recover what we had lost or where we had been so there is a danger, I think, in working with local institutions in these aggregate contexts. Um, the second, uh, or second comment is, um, you know, if I had to summarize what I said today, uh, my uh, takeaway from my research is that women enter marriage with an initial level of bargaining power. And barring large social and institutional changes or implementation of significant laws for the vast majority of women, the change in her initial bargaining weight over her life cycle will be limited. If so, and if you think of women then over their life cycles, the policies for empowering women, the most effective policies for empowering women are going to be investment in girls' education, health, in women's safety nets, ensuring that a woman enters a marriage with a well-defined identity and a well-defined sense of herself. This actually ties back to the biggest learning from COVID. Countries pay a high price if they ignore the quality of public health, infrastructure, public schooling, and social safety nets. Not just because these investments are essential to deal with the aggregate shocks 
are only likely to increase over time, but also because it is these very same investments in the public sphere that have the largest impact on women. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Anjani. And we're now on the hour, so we're going to wrap it up. Um, and I'd like to start off by thanking our four wonderful panelists for a really interesting and engaging uh, conversation. It's been uh, really a real privilege to be the, the only male on this panel, and very appropriately uh, so. Um, I'd like to thank the whole team at 3IE for making this event possible, and to all of, all of you for joining us uh, from across the globe uh, for this uh, um, engaging panel uh, discussion. Um, the live stream of this video has been uploaded uh, to 3IE's YouTube channel. So if you'd like to rewatch it or, or share or share the, the, the webinar with others. Um, and we invite you to continue the discussion on Twitter. Uh, again, the tag is at 3IE News uh, for your tweets. Um, and remember, you can also subscribe to email updates uh, from 3IE by visiting our website, which is 3ieimpact.org. Um, and here you'll be able to learn about future events uh, and upcoming evidence dialogue series. So thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Sebastian. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.